we will be talking here often about the many different ways, I believe, songs sung, stories told, and love shared can lead us home. Because of the role popular folk music has played and continues to play in my life, I thought I would start by talking about the power of that music, as well as how far it appears we can see sometimes in darkened rooms or when our eyes are closed and we are simply absorbing and absorbed in the music. In the fall of 1961, I was 14. My third school in three years. The year before, I was in private school where I had taken some advanced classes, and so now here I was, a ninth grader at the high school, in freshman homeroom, taking lots of sophomore classes. Well, kids I'd previously gone to school with were either at the junior high or the private school. I was sort of a silly guy with undiagnosed dyslexia who turned out for freshman football, got hurt, walked away. To the surprise of the coaches, came back, finished the season, and continued to try to make my way and find a few friendly faces in a school of over 3,000 kids. Rock and roll had officially entered the white suburban mainstream when Elvis Presley appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show on September 9, 1956. Two years later, the Kingston Trio offered an acoustic alternative when their version of Tom Dooley topped the charts in November of 1958. And over the next five years, those two types of music competed for popularity among what became known as the Baby Boomers. And then in November of 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. 79 days later, February 9th in 1964. The Beatles appeared on Ed's Sullivan show and the screaming now no longer in horror but in hope and delight as the soundtrack of a generation began to change forever. But back to the fall of 1961. I was a certifiable folky who knew the names of everyone in the Kingston Trio, the Brothers Four, the Chad Mitchell Trio, the Lime Lighters, as well as the first names of the two Smothers Brothers and the last names of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Each of these groups was releasing two or three long playing albums a year, and any money I could earn or get a hold of and any suggestions for birthday or Christmas gifts included asking for the latest of those recordings. I had a used $15 silver tone guitar from Blessing and Tui Music Store, as well as a $20 banjo that I picked up at a pawn shop. A woman at the church, Helen Louise Landsberg, was teaching me guitar. Dutch Groshoff was chain smoking Salem cigarettes while separately teaching my older brother and me banjo out of the back room of the music store. I was horrified and heartbroken that Dutch often spent the first half of my half-hour lesson telling me what a star my older brother was. Heartbroken, but also determined. For lots of years growing up, I had a room of my own. When I started high school, I got a portable record player that not only played 45s or singles, but 33 and a third LPs, long playing vinyl records. The record player was on a small table next to the bed. The album covers often strewn on the floor. In the high fidelity world, it's taboo to stack LPs, but in the world of a single three inch speaker and in the mind of a freshman in high school, I would stack as many as four or five LPs on top of each other. And eventually the extra scratching sounds that the songs acquired simply became part of my listening experience. When it was time to turn the light out, I would usually choose one album, place it on the turntable, listen as it dropped, and the arm with the semi-precious diamond needle moved toward and then touched the black vinyl. My eyes were usually closed, and for that moment in my waking dream, I was Chad, Dave, Mike, 
Lou, Bob, Dick, Tom, or John. If I was still awake when the arm of that record player finished its trip and began to turn itself off, I could imagine in that dark room with my eyes closed that some of the silent cheers that only I could hear were for me. What I could not have imagined then was how many kids in their bedrooms or sitting near the wood cabinet of the family hi-fi were listening to those same songs, embedding their dreams and creating their own memories that would last them and us a lifetime. These days, during a Brothers Four performance, I often catch a glimpse of someone in the front row, eyes closed in the darkened hall, sometimes leaning back slightly, mouths quietly and sometimes not so quietly, forming the words to the songs. And then after the show, out in the lobby, they may come up smiling, sometimes eyes glistening, declaring how every word came back to them and how grateful they are to have such powerful memories gently and fully awakened and somehow at least for a moment in the darkness to know what it is to feel young again. In the dark light of my bedroom All those many years ago Putting chords and words together A song from the radio When I could sing and play it close to right Like something lost was found Was how the music made me feel Still makes me feel somehow Oh, the first time that I sang that song It held a young man's dream Every time I sing it now holds an old man's memories. There's something about that old song I learned when it was new. All the people and the places shared it with and sang it too. It sort of tells the story about a man finding his way. All the twists and turns come back alive when I sing it to this day. The first time that I sang that song, it held a young man's dreams. Every time I sing it now, holds an old man's memories. There are songs each time we hear them that is music to our ears. Something awakens deep inside only our hearts can hear. And if that don't keep us singing, then the answer's nothing will. God knows I'm a believer and that I am singing still. The first time that I sang that song, it held a young man's dream. Every time I sing it now, holds an old man's memories. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down like a bridge over 